another thing, the National Weather Service, all of the storms that we're seeing right now for the last six weeks about this horrendous set of storms moving through the U.S. right now, there's another two. Uh, there's a hurricane uh, that was trying to form in the Gulf. I haven't seen the status in the last six hours, but we are now connecting into Saturn electrically. We have been for weeks, and this is going to go on for weeks. So uh, what I'm saying is Comet Ison, we could have weeks, even months, of solar conditions affecting Earth, uh, not just a single one event that uh, would happen as it say, passes by the sun on November 26th or some given right. date. You mentioned also that NASA is even presenting the report that we're going to have dust come from the uh, comet tail that will strike us twice as it hits inbound and outbound. The outbound dust to hit about mid-January 2014. Yeah, and, and that there again, and that, we talked about this before, that NASA is shadowing everything I do. I made the right. prediction because of that date, and I, I made that prediction because uh, the new moon passing, it's two days after new moon um, in January 2014, is the trigger mechanism, and the electrical alignment is such that we have Jupiter, Comet Ison, Earth, Earth's new moon passing, uh, that two days after new moon and Venus all aligning and so I said we could see some fine dust coming in uh, specifically sulfur dioxide and some other chemicals that are common around the orbit of Jupiter in between Earth and Mars coming in and we could connect into that so what does NASA do they come out and say this special only fine dust meteor stream is computer model to shoot at Earth and intersect with Earth on January 14th, uh, uh, January 12th of 2014. And by the way, it's supposed to come around the sun with the comet and another special beam is going to come right at Earth and they're going to crisscross on Earth on that given date. Now, the, the probability of such a fantastically uh, remote scenario happening is just uh, it's like uh, saying the sun's going to be here and it's going to pop over there and then the moon is going to flip over there. It's absurd. It's fairy tale science, but they're allowing this to go on because they have to try and overshadow my prediction with some kind of fairy tale science so they can say that they knew about this. But uh, the, the real result is that that January 12th to 14th time frame, and it could start as early as the 8th of January uh, 2014, we're going to have some serious weather. We could see some connections electrically, some auroral activity. By the way, along with that fairy tale science at NASA, um, is that it could cause upper atmospheric luminosity of clouds. So they're trying to get all of my predictions in under this one umbrella of some guy who's a meteor specialist uh, making this prediction on a computer. Uh, and, and like I say, the one stream has to follow the comet around the sun and then come directly at Earth. So how they come up with this stuff is just beyond bizarre. It's really, really uh, at best fairy tale science. By the way, no comet has ever done this before. There's never been any reason to believe that any comet would ever do it in the future. So why comet Ison? Uh, it's, it's laughable what's going on here. Um, yeah, exactly. But, yeah, there's there's but, inconsistent information and uh, they, they're not keeping their story straight at NASA, are they? No, and by the way, remember a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the official size of Comet Ison nucleus was five kilometers, and I pointed out that Comet Halley's nucleus is seven kilometers. Comet Halebop, which was a medium-sized comet, was they said was 42 kilometers, and now they've downgraded the size of this comet nucleus to two kilometers but it's supposed to be the comet of the century. You know, it, they're just all over the place. They can't keep their story straight. Then the story gets more and more bizarre all the time. How would you tell people to prepare for what's coming? Because there's no absolutes now, but there's a scientific potential for a major 
blackout for crop failures. And the probability, if there's an Earth-centric CME, we could have a Carrington-style event, which I think is the most probable event to happen, along with the danger of an airborne plague of swine avian flu. Back in a moment with Professor James McCanny. Stay tuned. JMCCSCI.com's website. She was reading uh, script. Yeah. Welcome back, uh, Professor McKinney. Um, you have made a comment on the break about a lady that called into the uh, Alex Jones show and mentioned about the danger of the ice on comet triggering off a uh, coronal mass ejection. We have to realize that things such as an avian pandemic from uh, H to 7N9, uh, this very grave danger that if it is an Earth-centric CME, which is, again, remember, it's my analysis from all the data that I've read and all your work, which I think is the most brilliant on this in the electric universe, that the major CMEs, including the one called the uh, Carrington event of 1859, was most probably triggered by a, uh, by a comet, a cometary passage in the inner solar system. Uh, the fact that this is happening, we don't have a, a uh, you know, an exact prediction to say with the orbit and the direction that this will be Earth-centric, but if it is, it's obvious that the government is doing a series of of terrorist activities, false flags, including the Boston bombing, where the FBI kind of monitored at the very least, they allowed it to happen and were total under surveillance. It's my feeling that uh, the thesis that this lady that called into the show was correct, but uh, I don't think Alex thought it was a big deal. That really, you know, a lot of people say these things don't happen. Well, the fact is, yes, they do happen. And in fact, Disasters like an avian pandemic or a CME, the government just and these globalist maniacs love chaos as to use as a disaster to amplify their powers, their control, and their hegemony. Right, and they, they what they have been using uh, since 911s because of the tremendous negative reaction. I don't think they expected the tremendous negative reaction that came after 911. So since then. They've been using weather modification and so-called acts of God to, and that's why they're so uh, intent, I believe, on using a, a solar flare to pull down the power grid because right. it's a perfect cover story. Yeah, and they're not going to let you North Korea do it. This is, and by the way, I hear those people sending me stories. Oh, North Korea is going to do it. No, no. If it happens, and again, it's an F, big F, but I think that there's a significant possibility that we're going to see some of the power grid government out somewhere. Let's say that it just goes out in uh, the southern hemisphere, and we lose 50% of the grid in South America, South Africa, and Australia. That is going to crash the world economy. It's going to cause a major famine, uh, and it will crash. It'll, it'll bring about martial law in this country and around the world. That's all you need. You don't even need a, you know, everything to go down. You just need to have enough. Just let's even ultraviolet strobing of the crops for for a matter of an, of two hours. And if you have massive crop failure, you have got famine, you have got disaster, you have global chaos. Yeah. By the way, I'm I'm glad you mentioned the, the idea of uh, crop failures and induced crop failures. I just spent uh, about five weeks examining forests, and it may sound kind of a strange thing for a guy that studies comets to be doing, but the uh, the forests around the United States are dying, and I would say more than dying, they're dead. What I have yeah. seen is I've never seen anything like this in my life. Yeah, do, uh, do you know why it is? It's the uh, intermycorrhizae, the intermycorrhizae uh, lichen is dying because it's uh, destroyed by uh, by the toxins from aluminum, thorium, and barium being put in the upper atmosphere as part of the globalist control system by the World Constitution Parliament Association, United Nations, and these global maniacs of actually geoengineering the planet. They've supposedly put this uh, upper atmospheric particles up to deflect the CME when I was one of the doctors uh, for U.S. Space Command, Buckley and Peterson Air Force Base. I found out firsthand information given to me that's what they're doing in geoengineering the planet. <clears throat> I shared this with Dr. Isley, who founded in 1958 the World Constitution Parliament Association, and spent an entire evening with him, and he gave me the Federation of Earth documents and their geoengineering documents uh, back in 97. So this is not like airy fairy out there. This is stuff that is, uh, they're panicking, and they have been panicking for decades, long before these comets showed up, of losing the power grid and the control system and the uh, satellites 
due to a act of God in a sense by a comet triggering off of CME like the Carrington event of 1859. So this is not something to be blown off. This is something to take seriously. Yeah, well, uh, I, I, I could not quite figure. I, I think that under uh, normal conditions, if somebody called in and talked to Alex Jones about such a thing, he might consider it, he might talk about it. In fact, uh, a number of years ago, he actually did a blip on similar topics. Uh, talking about uh, magnetic pole shifts, and he, he was very confused about what he was talking about, but nonetheless, he did mention Well, he never covered the like issue. That. I would think in an offhand but, comment, my, my guess is if you approached him the right way or if they contacted you, you'd be more than willing to come on and do a show interview and say, look, we're not setting dates, we're not telling you this is an absolute, but it's something that needs to be considered because the globalists have more information sources than we do, and they're obviously in much more of a panic because of their external behavior. You can look at their behavior. The Boston bombing, now the arming of Al-Qaeda, al nusra Al-Qaeda, which will start this war to really heat up in the Middle East. The policies with North Korea that almost triggered off a nuclear exchange there. Uh, all of these things show a kind of behavior that indicates the globalists want an external level of chaos at an unprecedented level. Uh, and uh, they want to get control. They want to stop the guns. Obama is passing an executive order to prevent sales of international guns and bullets to Americans, like the Glock and bullets that they can't obtain here because the Department of Homeland Security has bought now over $2 billion, and it's increasing. And even the Senate and, and, and the House Republicans are trying to pass the bill called an ammo bill. That's the initials of it to uh, prevent the federal government from literally locking down access to bullets to sidelight the uh, Second Amendment. Uh, this is really getting over the top, and it indicates if you look at all these external behaviors, the government and the globalists behind them are in a panic about something big coming, and they're not disclosing it to the public. Yeah, uh, you know, but you, you have to understand that the number of guns in the United States is astronomical. I, I just saw an ad. I happened to be sitting in a, you know, like a, a doctor's office the other day, and there was a hunting magazine. I can't remember what it was, Field and Stream or one of those. And I was flipping through it, and there was a high-powered rifle advertised, very nice, you know, high-powered rifle. And it's, but what struck, caught my attention, and I normally don't look at hunting magazines, but just happened to be the one on top, and I'm looking through it. There was a high-powered rifle, and I don't even know the type or anything. It had a scope on it. Five million sold was the advertisement. And I'm thinking, yeah, exactly. five billion, that's a boatload for one model of one gun yeah. with a scope on the, it. And for every the, 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 uh, one number of those, five I, million, there's, there's probably uh, 20 boxes of shells sitting somewhere on the shelf. That's right, a lot now, of firepower. The number that I've heard that is currently sitting in uh, Americans' garages, their prepper shelter, whatever it is, is 93 million armed Americans with half a billion guns. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, you know, I don't a, think the federal uh, government has any conception that, that has any conception that any attempts to actively take guns away from Americans, so they have to have a lateral or obtuse act, which is an airborne plague or a power shutdown due to a coronal mass ejection or something they're not preparing the public for. They're not doing anything to harden the grid. There was a law passed three and a half years ago that was blocked by a re rhino Republican uh, Senator Lisa Murkowski that would have hardened the grid at a cost of several hundred million dollars uh, for all of North America, including Canada, Mexico, and the United States, and it was blocked. So the, the real scientists like Dr. Mishu Kaku and 40,000 okay. co-scientists have been putting this before the Congress and Senate. The Congress basically passed the law, and it was blocked by the Senate and uh, never pushed forward. Amazing. is the weapon of choice. Welcome back. And um, so I would put out this challenge. I would challenge any radio host, any television host, interview Professor McCanny, lay out the facts, raise questions, realize that unless you have an avian pandemic, unless you have a CME, unless you have a, quote, a plausibly deniable natural disaster, the government's not going to move forward. This bombing in... in uh, that occurred in Boston, the next level, I would think is much more likely not just a medical waste bomb, but a nuke. 
a, not just a suitcase nuke, but a container-sized one coming across the border from Mexico or through one of the ports that'll, that'll show up in a major city center. And people say, no, that can't happen. I said, look, I work with Special Forces in Delta. I spent an entire week in 97 with their American Academy of, Anti- of Environmental Medicine at a conference in St. Louis talking to Special Forces in Delta. We spent hours and hours of all the war game simulations they're doing, and for over 40 years they have been doing simulations of nukes going off in U.S. cities. So this is not something that people should take lightly. Uh, they, well, if you had a plausibly deniable disaster like this coming from the sun, you have a perfect excuse to have martial law. You can't attack the public directly. You have to have the public in disarray from a Navy and pandemic or a CME that's knocked up the power grid and the satellite communications in order to do what they want to do. There's no other way about it. you got 94 million armed Americans. Even if the government tried to stop any more sales of bullets, we have enough bullets to fight the American government and every other army on the planet for 25 to 30 years. So this idea that the American government can kind of take over and do martial law directly is just hogwash. They yeah, it's, it's silliness. It, that's, it's best. Yeah, but it's they have to go laterally. If they have it laterally and they have a case fatality rate of 20% of an avian pandemic or they have that and soon they get hit with another thing like a CME or a series of them over a period of maybe 8, 10, 12 months with extreme weather, you've got a situation now where you've got all the modus to have true martial law. Just look at how they took this bombing situation and were kicking down doors and literally violating every possible rule uh, of common sense of decency, pulling people out of their homes and telling them to put their hands up or else. I mean, just for two kids that were out there with these bombs, as if they couldn't tell when they were there with the bomb sniffing dogs and 2,400 personnel. And this was a, uh, a, a drill and they tried to pretend it wasn't a drill. I mean, it just goes on and on. The government wants to have total control. Yeah, well, uh, one thing I noticed, Dr. Bill, in the issue with Boston, which I didn't follow it 100% because I was busy with some other things, but one of the street shootouts uh, apparently was just one of these guys, over 200 shots fired. Uh, that tells me that the Boston police, the, the finest in Boston, are not very good shots. 200 shots without hitting anybody uh, in a neighborhood. There was a lot of lead flying around there. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that, that's I'm amazed bad. That more people were killed. <clears throat> well, yeah, exactly. Better. There's, there's enough uh, anomalies about this whole situation. Now we have three more people in custody that are apparently affiliated with this Boston bombing. Someone had to train them how to make these type of bombs. There had, was also a third bomb that was in the uh, library. So there's something very anomalous about this whole situation. And uh, I think that we're going to be warmed up to another false flag coming up. They're going to keep on increasing these until Homeland Security and uh, FEMA have such power that when a real disaster strikes, like a CME or an avian pandemic, they will have real modus to move forward to a full martial law situation. And the public will gladly hand over and get an RFID chip to track them to make sure they're safe to travel because they've been given the vaccine, they've been given a tracker chip, and they've turned in their guns. That's what I see coming. Yeah, exactly. And uh, by the way, you were mentioning, we're, we're talking about the Alex Jones show, and the, the danger of, say, a woman coming on and trying to paraphrase what I said, or we, actually we were both talking about that on your show the last time. Right. The, the danger of that is that that isn't the whole story. That's no. a smidgen of the whole story. Then for Alex to say, "Well, that's yeah," and, 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 well, and a person, but, Alex but, by, let me by say large, like would, Alex would say it. He, he would do a proper. <laughs> yeah, he, he, yeah. First off, I'm sure that offhand, he if he looked at the facts, he'd probably look at that and say, with pretty darn certainty, that yeah, there's a potential for the government to use this. Just like uh, Rahm Emanuel said, don't let any disaster go to waste. I'm certain if Alex was presented the whole facts with you being interviewed, he would look at it and say, yeah, the government, if they think this is a real possibility, they'd be prepared with the, with the safety off to flip into a full martial law uh, role if the power grid goes down because of the CME because they can cry plausible deniability that they weren't responsible, even though they didn't harden the power grid, even though they didn't inform the public to prep to even have three weeks of food and water, no problem. They're more than willing to go into martial law with a full coverage. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, uh, but but uh, we'll see what happens, see if I get a call on this. 
I'm not. Well, I'm hoping. I'm hoping you will because Alex has a lot of clout. There's other hosts. I know that if you if you wrote an article and it was posted up on Drudge, uh, people maybe that may be another good idea is to send an article to Drudge, Drudge Report or one of the other major things, or even send it over here so we can post it up on Genesis Network's website and our website. Uh, the, the key thing is people need to understand that the globalists are in a panic. I, as I said this before. They're, if you look at the thesis from a distance, they're expecting an extinction level event of whatever kind that they aren't in control of, and it's a hard endpoint where they have to use it or lose it before this event happens. In my guess, that event is probably sometime in 2013 or 2014, and they're in a panic to get total control because things will become so chaotic. One of the greatest things they're afraid of is an educated <clears throat> public. Uh, you can have guns, you can have survival food, you can have a lot of things. Uh, you can have people that have their safe shelters, you can have all of that. But one of the most dangerous things the public can have is information. Uh, and that's why uh, when I talk about comets, when I talk about the true nature of the electrical nature of the solar system and the fact that weather is caused by electrical conditions, not solar light, and uh, when I take NOAA to task or the National Weather Service or NASA, uh, I'm not doing it because I have a grudge on somebody. I'm doing it because the public has to be well-educated. And you have to understand that NOAA, the National Weather Service, NASA, are front agencies to keep the public stupid. So let's call it what it is and, and understand that an education process, that the more people that become educated to the real working of the, the solar system of weather and the things that affect us right down here on the surface of the Earth, uh, that is a very dangerous public because now not only do they have arms, do they have food, do they have a place to go, and they're, but they're smart. A smart well, I, person I think what's is happening a lot is more that, dangerous than a dumb person, let me tell you. Well, I think that the number of people that are informed, uh, I like it to think of it like an onion or shells. Uh, there's probably about 3 to 5 percent now, and it's growing very rapidly. They're fully prepping up and getting ready, and they're fully aware. There's another 25 to 35 percent who are no longer living in, in, in a dreamland. They realize, even in, as we mentioned the first hour with Hardy Schlanger, that there's Democrats that are freaked out by Obama and realize he won't even talk to them. We have a situation now where the population is getting realizing we don't just have a progressive Democrat or even a collectivist. We have someone that's a global fascist. And, and, the, and the government, by and large, is dysfunctional. It doesn't matter if it's Republican or Democrat. We see it with Lisa Murkowski blocking, hardening the power grid. When major scientists like Mishu Kaku, who's on every TV broadcast you can imagine, and 40,000 astrophysicists, physicists, electrical engineers have stated that the power grid is fragile. It's like an old tar paper shack in Haiti. It needs to be hardened, even just from adding windmills, power generating plants, and, and solar panels on the roofs. The transient surges will blow the power grid all to pieces. We had a person do a keystroke in Yuma, Arizona on September uh, 8, 2011, and it blew the power grid for about 6 million people here in Baja, California, in, in, in uh, Mexico. So the problem is that real issues aren't being dealt with. Real fragility and real weaknesses aren't being dealt with. The real scientific possibility of a catastrophe that can literally crash your civilization isn't being dealt with, including the uh, commercial airliner bringing an avian pandemic in. Nothing is being done. And the right questions need to be asked, and we need to prepare personally and nationally, or we're going to face the music. It won't be funny. Back in a moment. Welcome back, and Professor McKinney, um, yeah, you mentioned an incredibly important uh, comment uh, on the break, that this is the largest comet grazing or passing near a planetary uh, planet in the solar system in around 3,000 years. We also know that the action at a distance theory you put together is well supported, that it can trigger off extreme weather, ionospheric changes, superquakes, and supervolcanic activity, uh, and we could have stored energy in various tectonic plates or volcanic magma domes like Mount Fuji in uh, Japan, like the New Madrid fault system, etc., that can cause upthrust tsunamis that can trigger off major supervolcanoes to blow. And when this passes the, the, uh, Mars, it's actually 
going to graze it so close that it actually will take a month for the tail to pass through. Uh, it also carries a debris field that could cause, in effect, a meteor storm, not only on Mars, but we're going to have debris as it passes both to the inner solar system and back out, which means that there may be a comet storm strike the Earth as well uh, with this object, even though it's going to be millions of miles away, its tail will not be. In fact, will pass through the tail debris field uh, twice. So there's some things happening. You mentioned September is when it's actually going to affect Mars and the early morning sky, and it is predicted to be 16 times brighter than the moon, which means it's no little tiny comet. This is a big sucker comet. This is a monster, and if it does have effects uh, at action at a distance or triggering off a CME or volcanic or earthquake activity or superstorms, we're going to have a rough ride, aren't we? Uh, yeah. Um Here's the situation, uh, and let's start with what's going on right now. Uh, for right. a couple of weeks, about two and a half weeks, I've been monitoring the United States. The weather conditions, and I, one thing is the upper level weather conditions are tremendous, uh, tremendous weather conditions, but on the low level, we have had uh, cloud cover, low level cloud cover for two and a half weeks, something that's totally unprecedented. And so uh, the, the point is that I believe this has been manipulated so that people cannot see Comet Lemon. It's also an experiment. Uh, by the way, Comet Lemon is a comet that's very visible in the early morning sky. Uh, the uh, um, uh, the, uh, the comet called Comet Ison is going to be visible uh, in the morning sky starting next September. And so, uh, and, and it's going to come within seven million miles of Mars, which means it could envelope Mars in its, uh, uh, it could envelope Mars in its comet tail. Um, uh, and and so I think what's going on right now is they're experimenting with keeping the cloud cover over the entire United States so nobody can see this. Uh, the the issue of a comet coming that close to a planet in the inner solar system planet, we have not seen this in 3,000 years. The ancients talk about large comets coming near Mars and having major effects on the planet Mars. Uh, right. leaving, alleviating Mars. Mars used to be a blue planet, we are told, by the ancient. Right. And so uh, the point is that NASA is, is not reporting this. In all of the reporting that NASA is doing about Comet Ison, they start in November. Well, the biggest event in the last 3,000 years is happening in September and the 1st of October. It's going to come within 7 million miles of Mars. It will be visible in the early morning sky. A moonless sky, Mars is a naked eye visible planet. The comet will be large at that point, and for weeks leading up to that, we could be seeing interplanetary electrical discharges, mind you. So yeah. I think right now we are in an experimental phase where they're locking down the country weather-wise so that nobody can see this. Right. In other words, even with a telescope, even with just binoculars or, or a visible eye, you're going to see an incredibly large comet naked to the visible eye, uh, literally grazing Mars and producing inter inter interplanetary uh, discharges of plasma across space uh, that could trigger off major problems on Mars, but it can also trigger off the CME from the sun, and it could ex cause extreme weather even at a distance to Earth, even though we're not going to pass anywhere near more than, I think, it's 55 million miles from, from uh, Comet Ison. Uh, yeah, and so the, the, the next thing is that even though uh, that's going to be a long distance uh, from Earth, we could have electrical interactions from that comet simply because of its electrical alignment with Jupiter and Venus. Right. In, other words, in other words, it creates a plasma bridge between large uh, planets like Jupiter and Venus, and as a result, you can get inter interplanetary discharges of plasma that can have dramatic effects in our ionosphere, and the uh, activation of plasma discharges from the ionosphere to the Earth, the tectonic plates to trigger off earthquakes. This is, in fact, how earthquake weapons work. A lot of people think it's just HARP. 
it's actually using harmonic discharges of energy from the upper atmosphere that releases the tectonic plates by pumping enough energy to cause the resistance between the rock faces to drop to zero temporarily. That's how they work. Well, uh, uh, what I'd like to do, and uh, we probably don't have time to finish it on this show, but sit down and write a list of the dates, and I, I've got, like I said, I don't have my notes with me right here, but uh, the next time we'll talk about this, we'll talk about specific dates, specific types of give events us a, that give us, happen. Give us, give us a couple of uh, vague ideas, just from memory, as to which dates you see coming, or months when you expect Okay, well, the, the Mars event will be next September, starting around the 15th of September uh, to the 1st of, of uh, October, and then possibly extending beyond that. Um, as far as Earth is concerned, uh, the November uh, interaction where this comet is going to interact with Mercury, a direct electrical alignment right up behind Mercury. We could, in fact, see Mercury going comet at that point. That's a term that I use to indicate that the planet Mercury could turn into a comet, uh, discharging the solar capacitor. So these are events... Um, I'm told that uh, Comet Ison is already sporting a sunward spike, but of course NASA is covering it up by saying that yeah, this so, is a jet. Yeah, yeah but, but in other words, you're talking about a plasma jet coming off the forward uh, surface, pointing toward the sun. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you mean. And, by and they're, yeah. they're talking about it being a jet from an ice ball. Well, jets from ice balls flip around <laughs> and, and twist. <laughs> And, and change directions. Uh, NASA is doing its best to cover up what's going on with this comet. Yeah, they don't know except your theory that in fact plasma discharges, these are highly charged, you know, in terms of the amount of kilojoules or terajoules of energy, highly charged uh, interstellar objects that can affect planetary and solar activity at a dramatic level. Yeah, uh, so anyway, we'll, we'll see, uh, uh, have a lot of time to discuss these events. As, Let's do that on uh, the next show. Uh, so we have two minutes left. Let's summarize. If you were to tell well, someone, let's say on, on a major network show or if you're on Alex's show and you mentioned in two minutes, what would you say to the people listening to raise the issues, to ask them to ask better questions and say, look, we don't have absolutes here, what would you say? Well, and that's just the point. Uh, things can uh, things can change. Solar system conditions can change. There's a lot of issues that can change. Uh, uh, the power of this comet, uh, we don't know that we're actually in a very low solar maximum, one of the lowest solar maximums in decades and decades and uh, probably 50 years. So but it's also the time when you have the biggest storms. The biggest storms happen in low solar maximum. We have low uh, sunspot activity. You have the biggest amount of large storms, don't you? X and M class. Well, the uh, you know it's hard to say. It's hard. prediction is hard, and I try and keep away yeah. from dates and solid yeah. predictions. But uh, yeah, we're not predicting. We're laying out the we're laying in both the the scientific uh, substrata of a thesis that indicates this could potentially be very catastrophic and yeah. that it, and that they may have an additional science that we don't know that gives them a higher predictive uh, ratio to indicate that the globalists and the astronomers working in tier one science know that this is more dangerous than we even assume yeah well the, the other thing is you have to understand they could be using these to cause other issues like pulling down the entire entire power grid on purpose in other words bring it down but it actually isn't even affected by the by the comet because it doesn't produce the conditions but the thesis out there that it might they use it and actually physically just selectively part pull parts of it down is what you're saying yeah exactly in other words they'll use us as a as a foil to say see they thought it would go down and they selectively pull the parts they want down at the same time they're setting up martial law that's another interesting thesis yeah so in other words, we need to watch this because we're, we're being fooled at every level and we need to watch that this is not another event we're being set up for. Exactly. Amazing. Thank you, Professor McKinney. We'll have you back on real soon to continue our dialogue with your list of notes and specific dates. Back tomorrow, Jerry Strybos in studio is our professional trainer. We take calls on every show, by the way, topically. Ryan with our Nutrimeds and brand new nutraceuticals coming for... Vitamin B1 and a special new vitamin E. 